Hi, good evening. My name is Stacy Van Gore, and I'm going to be your moderator for tonight's session, focusing on effective and collaborative communication uh, with our team. And we have fantastic panelists that will be joining you. I'm going to go through a couple of housekeeping issues, and then we're going to have a quick poll, and then I'll introduce you to our panelists. Uh, so we're excited to have you join us. And we're going to take audience questions throughout the session. So if you've been joining for the last few days, you know how this works. So I'll be looking for your questions in the Q&A. So look for the Q&A button that's over on the right, and that's where you will share your questions that you'd like to share with the panelists. And if someone else writes a question that you love, that you want our panelists to answer, it would be terrific if you could give theirs a little thumbs up so that we can prioritize the questions as they come. You'll also notice a chat bubble icon on the right of your screen, and that's a group chat for everybody who's in this session. So whatever you put there, everybody else is going to be able to see. So questions for the speaker go into Q&A. Chat with the other people that are in the session go into the chat button. Um, you, If you have any tech support needs, go ahead and push that tech support button at, that's near the home screen, it'll take you back to the coffee shop to help you be able to get back to that area. So again, I'm Stacey Van Gorp, and this is the session about effective and collaborative communication. I live in Iowa. I have 15-year-old twins who both have CF, and we're joined tonight by a fantastic panel. But we want to learn a little bit about who else is joining us. So I'm going to ask Danielle if she'll launch the poll, and we've got a question there about the your um, favorite ways to communicate with your care team outside of clinic. So let's see. Uh, we're looking for the poll question. The new poll is live. You might have to push the button that looks like a little poll, and you can chime in there to say your favorite way to communicate with your team outside of there. Let's see. Our panelists are welcome to chime into the poll as well. We'll keep the poll active for a few more minutes, or maybe seconds. I think seconds, maybe not minutes. And let's see. It looks like we've got about 30 people with us. My, According to mine, um, my chart seems to be pulling ahead, or maybe email. All right, so it looks like uh, an even split split between email and my chart. I know at my own clinic, sometimes if I send an email, they ask me to send it back through my chart. <laughs> so some of you might be living in that system as well. Uh, I can say in my most desperate moments, I have been so grateful for text messages from my care team when, you know, there's something that's emerging right now. Can my daughter go to cross-country practice during social distancing? But it's an answer that I feel like I need right now. So I'm grateful to all of those care teams out there who are willing to talk with us in all of those different ways. And we know that one size doesn't fit all when it comes to um, effective and collaborative communication. So we're going to dig into that a little bit more. Thanks for everybody who participated. And let's now go to our panelists. So we're going to start by asking each panelist in a quick round to tell us their name, their connection to cystic fibrosis and where they live. And um, I'm gonna ask Jennifer to start and then she's gonna hand it off from there. So go ahead, Jennifer. Sure, my name's Jennifer Weber. I have two daughters with CF. They are 21 and 18 years old and I live in North Carolina. And I'm gonna pass it along to Carol. Thank you, I'm Carol Chase. I am a social worker who tries to support patients and families who are living with CF, and I live in Maryland. And how about you, Ryan? Uh, Ryan Monahan. I was diagnosed when I was two years old. Uh, I live in Dallas, Texas, and I'm gonna pass it over to Melanie. Thanks, Ryan. My name is Melanie Abdelnor. I just turned 40 um, last month. I, I'm living with CF, and I live in Massachusetts. I go to Boston Children's Hospital slash Brigham and Women's. Back to you, Stacey. All right. So we know that we are all more than the story of cystic fibrosis in our families and in ourselves. So we want to ask a question that doesn't have to do with CF, and that the start of that question is, I love to. And so, Melanie, we're going to start with you this time. I love to. You fill in the blank. 
I love to be outside in nature with my son, Miles, who is nine. Carol? I like being outside, too. Mel, I love to hike in the national parks with my husband. How about you, Ry? Well, I love getting out with my wife and family, traveling, uh, getting to go golfing once in a while, and uh, mostly just spend time as a family. Jennifer, how about yourself? Similar to all of you, I enjoy spending time with my family, and I like early morning walks with our dog. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so if we could all go on a family hike together, that would be particularly awesome. <laughs> but <laughs> right now, we better get back to business. And so uh, the last question of our intro round is going to be, um, we're going to start with, I think collaborative conversations happen when? So we're going to start with Ryan, and this is really digging into our topic about how we can have collaborative conversations and effective communications with our care team. So Ryan, would you please start? I think collaborative conversations happen when? For me, it's all about preparing. So given how I might feel for uh, my upcoming appointment, preparing and then customizing my message to the care team. That's, that's kind of the best way for myself. Carol, how about yourself? Uh, I think it's best when people are actually hearing me and not just listening to me. Melanie, how about you? Yeah, I agree. To that effect, I think that collaborative yeah. conversations happen best when there's a foundation of shared humanity, when both sides come to the table seeing one another as a human being and with a level of openness and vulnerability. Jennifer? I think collaborative communication happens when we attend appointments, ready to share uh, information, but to uh, to build relationships with the CF care team and focused on the shared goal of health. Awesome. Well, uh, you can see that this is going to be a great panel. I think that there's a lot of commonality between us as panelists, but there are definitely particular points of view. And we know that's also true of everyone who is in the chat with us. So in the chat, if you have ideas about what is effective and collaborative communication, if you want to end that sentence, we would also love to hear from you in the chat. Um, so we're gonna have two kinds of questions today and we're also gonna take your questions. So remember, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A button. If you wanna chat with your the other folks on the, um, on the session, use chat for that. So we're gonna have long format and short format. We call the short ones popcorn. So we'll have a few pop, fun popcorn questions, but we're gonna go into a couple of longer format ones. And the first question is for Ryan and Jennifer. And the question is, how do you prepare for effective communication during your clinic visit? So on Monday, uh, my husband and I will take my twins to their clinic appointments. So I'm thinking about how to prepare, but I wanna know how do you prepare to have effective communication or what's a story about a recent visit and how you prepared? And Ryan, we're gonna start with you. Yeah, Stacey, I think for me, it, it kind of depends on how I'm feeling. Um, so what I like to do is before a, before an appointment, I go in knowing what my objectives are coming out of it. You know, am I trying to get answers on medication or am I trying to uh, find out about stuff that's that's going on for trials, you know, whatever it may be. So I try to prepare myself a little bit ahead of time for, um, you know, what's going to be coming up during the appointment, who all will I be seeing, and I try to customize my message for each care team member that I'm seeing. So. The things that I might ask my respiratory therapist are very different than things I'm going to ask my doctor. Um, and so that's kind of the way I approach any one of my appointments. And then that message varies if I'm healthy or if I'm sick. Um, and then I customize it even more to each person. Uh, and one of the things that I find, and, and some of this is probably my how I handle things both personally and professionally, but I find ways to relate to people. So I like to go to my resp respiratory therapist. I know you know, things about her, her family or where she likes to travel or my doctor, you know, the age that she has kids and what all they're doing. And so I find it's best to relate to people that way. And uh, that's kind of the way I've found as a, as a best approach to effectively communicating with my team. Jennifer, I know you had some, some good stuff. How about yourself? Okay, sure. So I think whenever starting with a new team, uh, it's important first to have a conversation about communication. So meta-communication, 
Like I wanted to know how to contact the care team between appointments, like with that poll question um, to prevent me from waiting three months, like about an issue that could have been addressed earlier. So, but then the CF team is there for you. And as a parent of children with CF, the care that my children got was a lot was largely impacted by the information that I shared with the team and how honest I was about what had or had not been going on at home. And so we as parents or our daughters now who are adults going to appointments by themselves go in expecting to be listened to, but also expecting to listen. And we have our questions, most of which are answered naturally during the appointment with the different providers on the team. But I would always check my list to make sure to ask any other questions before the doctor or whoever the person needed to answer the question before that person left the room. And then now before our daughters transitioned to going to appointments on their own, we used to discuss our questions ahead of time with them, like the night before the appointment, to decide and involve them in deciding what needed to be communicated to make them a part of that. And I think that's helped ease their transition to the adult clinic now. And we, when they were younger, we brought food and snacks and things to keep them busy during appointments to mm -hmm. help pass the time positively because clinic days can be very long. And it also eased the stress and helped appointments to flow more smoothly. And finally, like Ryan said, I, we look to each appointment as an opportunity to, to build a good relationship with the CF care team. So that's my response. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Ryan and Jennifer. I think, um, you know, a lot of the threads that you're pulling out there is it strikes me just how much time you're spending to be thoughtful, not not just about what you need or what your children might need, but also what the care team needs to know from you. And I think that's really an interesting idea that it's not sort of my grocery list of what I need to be able to get from clinic, but I hear both of you talking about you know, what is it that's going to help me do my best with that clinic, um, with that person on my team? So I think that that's really interesting. And then this idea about meta communication, like talking about how we're going to talk to each other is really also an interesting idea and a great tip, I think, that we can take forward from this first set. Um, all right, we're going to go to a quick popcorn question next. And this one, we are hoping that people will join us in the chat and share some of your ideas. So this one is, if you had to compare your most recent clinic communication to a movie or a song, Mel, <laughs> if you had to compare your most recent clinic communication to a movie or a song, what would it be? Okay, this is for anybody um, that's out there with us. All right, any of our panelists, who wants to go? Well, since you called me out, my the song that I would relate my last visit to is a song that goes reunited and it feels so good because I went um, into clinic for an in-person visit since the pandemic started and it felt so good to have eye contact and that connection and the small talk. So that was my song. <laughs> Extra points for Mel for singing. Way to go, Mel. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> All right, let's see, Ryan or Carol or Jennifer, anybody else have a movie or a song to describe your clinic communication? I'm a movie junkie. So I had uh, I had an appointment at the very beginning of the pandemic. And for me, my, my movie connection was Panic Room, where you feel <laughs> like you're, you're locked in this area and you can't get out and you don't know what's going on outside. Uh, but now I'm at a point where I'm in Independence Day mode, where I'm ready to get out and fight for my freedom. and and uh, the aliens that are that are COVID are uh, we're going to beat them. So I'm ready for that freedom again. I think you should ask your team what movie they're thinking about. Then you should tell them you're thinking of Independence Day. This feels yeah. to me like a real way to get insight from each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Carol or Jennifer, either of you want to chime in or are you passing? Yeah, I'm going to pass. I I don't recall movie titles very well. I can tell you the story, but I can't tell you the title. No Sorry problem. About that. <laughs> <laughs> I, could say, I could say Freaky Friday because I feel like I've changed roles and my daughters are doing their appointments without me, but they're they're well prepared, better prepared than <laughs> the team in the movie. So. That's, That's great. great. All right. Thank you for being good sports, everybody out there listening and to our panelists as well. We're going to move on to something more serious. And um, I'm going to read the question, but I'm also going to point out a question that came up in the chat because they it feels like uh, they have a lot of overlap. So 
um, you know, sometimes we go to clinic and we feel like the collaborative communication is so easy. The effective communication is so smooth. It's just right there. But other times when we go, um, we might experience conflict or not even, it could be conflict, but it could also be something that we sometimes call a mismatch. So maybe my style doesn't match with the provider or what I'm looking for or my point of view doesn't mismatch. So some kind of friction happening there. And so we're gonna ask Mel, Melanie and Ryan to tell us in just a minute about strategies that they use to overcome that conflict and mismatch. And I saw in the, um, in the questions that somebody asked, um, they felt like that their social worker just wasn't giving them the kind of implementable advice or care that they were looking for. So it was the thing they felt like they needed, they didn't feel like they were getting. Um, and so how would you go about addressing it? So I think we'll ask Melanie and Ryan to weigh in about strategies they use to overcome mismatch and conflict. But I bet Carol might want to also address that specific question after that. So um, Melanie, would you start? Sure. Um, good questions. I have had experience um, with this as well. I have people on my care team um, who the, our energies just sort of don't match and so i've learned to manage my expectations so i want to just divide into two separate boxes if the clinician is someone who's not going anywhere and i'm going to be stuck with them for a few years then i manage my expectations that this person just can't they can't be anyone other than who they are even if i'm looking for something else and so i will find other allies within that, like I will curtail like my questions to clinicians that I do feel connected to. Um, and if it's a serious concern, then I have voiced that to the medical director as well. Um, but if it's somebody who, if it's a, a clinician or a physician that I'm choosing, then I make sure to feel empowered that I, the choice is ultimately mine. So there was one specialist, it was a complicated time and they were having a hard time figuring out something. And so I didn't give up because I knew I know my body the best. And so I knew that there was something wrong. And so I changed that specialist three times until I found a good fit who was willing to hear me and validate my concerns. And we're together five years later. Um, so I, I think it's important to manage my expectations, but to remember that we do have power in our care. Ryan, how about you? No, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, I've been, I've been very fortunate that I have a good relationship with my care team. And similar to your experience, I've been with them now for several years, and that helps you build good rapport. And you know, you know how you can interact with those people without upsetting them or, or vice versa. They, they know what my lifestyle is like. But, um, I think for me, it's really important to be direct and you are your own best advocate. And, and so I mean that you in the collective sense, uh, you as the individual or the patient with CF, you as the parents on behalf of your children, the spouse, but you as a, as a party are their best representative. And so knowing what you're trying to do on a daily basis or how your lifestyle fits your care, you need to be able to relay that uh and and also be able to have some room to budge if there really is a, a method to the madness that they they're recommending you know you want to make sure that you're giving yourself the best care possible but not giving up on you know what you think is best for yourself either so um it, it's very challenging and being direct and and being to the point is not easy at all times but that's what i found to be kind of the best way for myself and Carol, you had some really good stories the other day. I would love for you to kind of share that with this group. <laughs> okay, well, I was actually going to chime in and say that, um, you know, personalities don't always match. And I'm really happy to hear Mel say she kept going. Believe it or not, your care team really wants you to get care. So whether it's going to be with the care team that you're currently working with or you find that your personalities clash or maybe you don't appreciate the um, knowledge or advice or the way they're giving it to you, there is always 
somebody else out there who's going to work for you. And we're happy when people get second opinions. We really are. We just want you to get care that, that you'll keep going to, right? If you don't connect with that care provider, you're not coming back. You're not going to come back with the regularity that, that they hope you will. So don't feel badly about it. I, I'm with Mel and Ryan. You've got to find somebody that you're going to work with well to keep working. Awesome. I am so, guilty of not wanting to hurt people's feelings, though. I have absolutely. to admit it. Absolutely. And, and to the person who asked the question in the chat, I, I particularly feel badly that it's a social work colleague that, that mm -hmm. you feel that way with. But, but again, if, if that doesn't work for you, then you got to you got to keep moving so you can get the help you need. Yeah, so I heard the um, sort of the, the uh, sort of array of suggestions and advice there. One is make sure that my expectations are reasonable for what I need from that person. Be direct, trying to ask the person explicitly what I need. Finding an ally, um, somebody who might be able to coach that person uh, to be yeah. a better fit for me or going and finding somebody else. And so I think that's a great continuum to think about, like starting starting with me, making sure I'm open, moving on to being direct, getting some support, or maybe moving on. And so um, I, I love that question, and thank you to our panelists for jumping in that way with it. Um, the next question, the next popcorn question that we have, uh, how, oh, I guess I would underline, though, across that whole continuum, I heard you all say, it's in your power. Right. That was the other thing I think you all underlined as well. Like that's those are all your choices. So I, I don't want to let that one slide away. Um, so the next uh, popcorn question we have, we've talked a lot about words so far and what I say and what I do. Um, but the next popcorn question is, what's one thing that's more powerful than words to communicate effectively with your provider or team? Anybody on our panel want to take that one on? And anybody in the chat is welcome to join in as well. One thing more powerful than words to communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. Eye contact. I think that so much communication happens without saying a word. So if you're, if I'm looking down at my phone, I'm sending a signal that I don't care your weight, like I don't care about your time or what you have to say. And vice versa, if a doctor or a clinician is just looking at their computer screen, then I don't feel valued either. Thanks, Mel. Anybody yeah. else more powerful? I would add body language. I think that's right along with what Mel is saying. You know, if someone's leaning in to your conversation or if, if, if they're not paying attention or they're answering pages, it's, it's hard to feel that they really are engaged in the conversation. I agree with both. <laughs> All right, I'm going to throw I'm going to throw one in this time, which is a chart. So a couple of times when I've had a hard time, like really helping somebody understand what our family's been going through, I've actually collected data and taken a chart in with me or been known to send a Google Sheet chart in advance. So that was pretty effective as well, that it was just getting lost in the words. I, I collected some data. I know um, people with CF and their families are great experimenters. And so, you know, helping mm -hmm. to put data to those experiments that you're undertaking, I think works well too. All right, I think another question that will really resonate for the folks um, in our audience, uh, we're going to start with Jennifer and Carol on this one. And this is, sometimes we find ourselves in moments that we know we need to speak up, that we know we need to be an advocate. And um, I think Mel, Melanie said it earlier, like, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, or I think sometimes we feel like, I don't want to cause any problems. And, um, but sometimes we have to find the courage to do that. So. We asked Jennifer and Carol to tell us a story about a time when they had to find the courage to speak up. And so, uh, Jennifer, we're gonna start with you. Okay, sure. When our older daughter was one year old, she needed her first bronchoscopy. She'd been born prematurely, and so when she was one year old, she weighed only 10 pounds. The morning of the procedure, we arrived at the hospital and learned that admitting that her CF doctor had broken her leg just hours before, and that she would not be performing the surgery herself. A fellow had been assigned. 
And when the fellow came up to meet us in pre-op, he took one look at her and said, she sure is tiny. I wonder if the bronchoscope will even work on her. He seemed very nervous and needless to say, that made us very nervous. And before we signed the consent forms, my husband and I asked to have a few minutes together and we paged our daughter's doctor, the one who was the broken leg, and she had sent a message that we could do that. And we discussed our concerns with her and said we weren't feeling comfortable. And she agreed that the fellow didn't exude confidence. And she said we should ask for the attending doctor to do the surgery instead. And she further supported us by saying she would communicate with that attending doctor. But the fellow returned to the room and we had to you know, communicate this information to him. And we just said that we were concerned this is our first bronchoscopy. She was small and we were requesting that the attending doctor perform the bronch. And he said that that was our right. And actually he really seemed a bit relieved. Um, but that ve was very stressful, but we listened to our feelings and we spoke up and we felt like, you know, she's our daughter. She needed us to advocate for her. And it was important that we listen to our intuition. So and I'll pass it along to Carol. So, wow, that's quite a story, Jennifer. Um, my story is about a, a young person, actually. He was um, probably around 10 or 11 and was having trouble putting on weight. And uh, the care team had been in discussion with his folks for almost about a year uh, about a gastrostomy tube placement and, you know, increasing calories overnight and all of that sort of thing. and as the attending physician was once again addressing mom and dad about she thought it was really the right time to consider putting in a, a tube <clears throat> i turned and looked at our patient and he was just dissolving into tears he couldn't talk but he, he was just he just tears started pouring down his face and i interrupted the attending physician and and said to her that i thought he had something to say that he seemed pretty unhappy and you know he very startled you know kind of looked at me and and i said no no she needs to hear can you help her understand why you're crying and he said well i don't need a tube i can gain weight i promise just tell me what i have to do tell me what i have to do so we had a long conversation about the amount of calories he needed and what the food would have to look like that he would eat on a daily basis and he wanted to try it and we tried it for six months and this young man is out playing soccer and he's going to middle school and he still does not have a gastrostomy tube so it's it's not always possible that you get what you want but i think it's important that as as a patient no matter what your age that you be able to share with your care team what your opinion is so that you can be heard. Thank you for those stories. And, and one of the things that strikes me about both of the stories is that you had to interrupt the flow of what was happening, right? And so when you're there for a procedure day, you know they're all sort of tightly scheduled and all these things are gonna happen and you and you have to kind of ourselves like carve out space in that flow that seems to just be coming at us and say stop a minute and that that was what carol did for the young man also that was in that appointment so i think probably step one in the courage is knowing that you can you can sort of put a put a pause in there it sounds to me like in both of their their, their advice i wonder if the panelists wouldn't mind if if we did a little practice here and so I think sometimes even imagining the words that we would say um, are, can be difficult. So there's somebody asking about what's the best way to talk to our current teams about wanting to meet with another center or get a second opinion. And, and it looks like um, what's the best way to approach a different care center? Um, oh, that's about approaching a different care center. But let's imagine that the person is interested in getting different advice for CFRD. And so if you were at your own clinic, but you wanted some different advice about CFRD, what are the actual words you might use, Ryan or Mel, to tell, to tell someone that you wanted to look into other options? Like what are, what's the sentence that would come out of your mouth? Uh, I think for me it would be, you know, wanting to understand why the first care team's not working correctly. 
um, and putting some thought into that process and, and those issues, and then trying to define for the next care team, these are the issues that I'm having, you know, am I justified in feeling this way? Because I do think you have the right to ask, why do I have this response? Why is this reaction happening? Um, and then trying to, I, I think it's perfectly fair on both sides to say, you know, I'm not sure I agree with that. Let me ask someone else. And when you go approach that, that other doctor, that other care team, you know, confirm that your concerns are valid. And, and if they're not, you know, get their help in understanding why that might be the case. So at least that's the way I, my initial reaction would be to think about that, that particular case. Yeah. Melanie, right. how about yourself? Uh, yeah, go, yeah go I think, sorry. I think that makes a lot of, you make a lot of good points. Um, but I also think it's like a case by case basis. I also don't think there necessarily has to be an explanation or a justification that we're, um, like Carol said, they're happy when we get a second opinion because they just want us to get care that we feel most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So, um, Stacey, to your point, the language I would probably, I would probably deflect and say, listen, my friend over at X, Y, and Z hospital told me about the way that they're doing their program is a little bit differently. I think I'm just going to go hear them out and then we can have a conversation and, and see which would be a better fit for me. I don't think that there would be a lot of hurt feelings with that approach. Awesome. I, I love that, that both of you are, um, you know, claiming your role as the decision maker in your care and sort of sharing the degree of information that you're comfortable with sharing to either team. Those are great examples. Carol, or um, Carol, anything that you want to add to that or Jennifer? I think that I would just uh, agree with both Ryan and, and Mel. I think that, um, you know, finding a good care team member <clears throat> is a really important step. And again, if you're not if you're not feeling it, if you're not connecting with them or you think that the information they're giving you is different than maybe what you've read or what you've heard, I, I would have that conversation. And I, I don't think anyone should feel badly about asking for a second opinion. Yeah. Anybody else? If you're comfortable, yeah, sorry. I think if you're comfortable with somebody else on the team, like. Um, if it's a social worker or someone else, you could also communicate with them and just say, I'm not comfortable. Um, you have a team that you're working with as well. So you can ally yourself with somebody else, but and it can still be appropriate because you're trying to you're trying to you're seeking care for your child or for yourself. So you and they want the same thing. So. Excellent. Well, thanks for the advice, everybody. I think it's helpful to just hear how other people might say it. Um, I think this is one of the things we can do to help ourselves is find a friend or a mentor or a confidant where we can um, help think about how, do, what are these words? What are the steps? How do I approach it? All right, we're gonna go to another, um, I think this question Melanie came up with and I love it. And so it's a popcorn question. What's one thing you learn not to do in communicating with your provider or team? So Melanie, I'm gonna let you start and then other folks can join in. I have learned not to doubt myself. Nobody knows our bodies better than we do. And if our and if my instinct is telling me that something's not right, then something's not right, damn it. Brian? <laughs> I think for me, it's about not winging it. You know, going into each appointment with an objective or a goal in mind um, and not going off the cuff or making a decision on the fly that you don't necessarily feel comfortable. That's kind of my feeling on it. Anything else you don't do? I, I, don't I like to leave an appointment. Oh. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. I just think it's important not to leave without your questions being answered. So if you still have a question at the end, make sure to ask it. Even if it's going over, um, over time, it's important to leave with, with that question answered. Awesome. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> it's okay. I would just lastly add, please don't go away angry. If you don't like something that somebody said or did or the way they addressed you, it's so important to stand and say something 
so that we can resolve issues before you leave the clinic. Awesome. Great advice, everybody. So just um, so our audience knows, we have three more planned questions, and then we'll, we'd love to take some of our questions from the audience. And so please keep sharing them with us. Melanie, did you have one more um, thing to add? I just wanted to add to what Carol said, because sometimes it's hard in the moment. If something doesn't feel right, it's hard to work up the nerve to say it. So I've had experiences where something didn't feel right, and I couldn't quite work up the nerve in the moment. So I emailed them afterward when mm -hmm. I got home, but I still cleared the air, and I was so glad I did. Excellent. Great advice. Thank you. So, um, Carol, the next question is for you. What might surprise us about effective and collaborative communication through the eyes of a member of a care team? So I think many of you may not realize how much your care teams really care about you. I mean, we really care about you. Even when you're gone from clinic, we, we have this discussion where, you know, if if folks are healthy, we generally see you maybe four, five times a year for half an hour, an hour maybe. Um, but we talk about you a whole lot more than that. <laughs> we talk about how to make things better for you, what other treatments we could get for you. We talk about your goals and the things that you want to do in your life and getting you to college and married and all those things. Um, and I think sometimes that warmth may not come completely communicated to you in the clinic because it's so rushed, because we're trying to get PFCs, because we're trying to get all the care team members in to see you. Um, they really do care a whole lot about you. Thanks, Carol. And um, Melanie, I'd like you to follow on to something that I think relates to what Carol just shared and to your opening comments, but can you talk more about the role of shared humanity in effective communication with our teams? Absolutely. That is something I'm so passionate about because from a patient perspective and a family perspective, you're asking me to trust you with my life. And how can I trust someone whom I don't feel a personal connection with? Something outside of the, the CF world or the, the medical world that keeps us engaged and connected. And I don't have to know your whole life story, but to exchange little nuggets, I need to know that my team sees me as more than a chart, that they see me holistically because CF is such a small part of my world. And I think that what is going on outside of the clinic room is affecting my health a of a lot more than what's happening in that clinic room. And so I think when I say shared humanity, it's just coming together as human beings first and foremost and connecting on a human level, respecting, opening, sharing, and then diving into the medical nitty gritty. I think that for me anyway, that's where like the sweet spot is and we have the most effective um, teamwork. Like, co-production, if you will. Melanie, what techniques have you found that draw that out in your care team? What are the ways that you get to that point of shared humanity? I find that that idea completely profound and transformative that you're talking about. And help us think about just how we help make that happen. Sure. Like Ryan sort of, Ryan mentioned this earlier also, is at the front of the appointment, talk about something not health related. Don't just come in the room armed with your agenda and want to get down to the nitty gritty. Like, hello, how are you? What's new? How's your family? Like, how about those Red Sox? Anything. And then it's have a, a little icebreaker there before you dive into the other stuff. And also, I think it's helped me a lot. Like, that doesn't happen without sharing. I have to be willing to put myself out there and not expect my team to be mind readers. And I think that that has been huge for me to connect with my team. I really sort of just, I think it, I feel it, I say it. And I think that's really worked in my favor. And I know that not everyone can do that, but you've got to give them something to work with. Say that again. I think it, I feel it, I say it. 
I don't even know what I just said. <laughs> I was like, hey, yes. <laughs> well, it just sounded to me like um, you're encouraging us to, to show up as whole people at the appointment. So how we are, it's not just how we're thinking, but also letting people know how, how we're feeling and then putting those things into words and um, inviting our providers to be vulnerable with us too. And seeing them as humans also, like they, their whole life isn't working as a physician or a clinician either. They have lives, they have families, they have other interests. I think that we, have, we need to be patient with them and, and see those human parts of them as well. It's a two-way street. Um, so the, the popcorn, uh, next popcorn question we're going to use here is what's one piece of advice you would give to your younger self or uh, to someone who might be having a rough patch in their relationship with their care team. And I think, Ryan, you might have been the inventor of this question, so I'm going to start with you. What's one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self or someone struggling with their team? Uh, so I, I dealt with challenges both uh, being younger with the disease and with my care team. So uh, a lot of it overlapped with me transitioning to college. Um, cause I had, I had two very different objectives in mind. One was to go off to a college, become independent, enjoy my, my life as a person. And the other was I have CF and I need to make sure I'm taking care of myself. Um, so I think the, the confidence in understanding the disease that I have now probably didn't, it didn't connect with me in the same way as, as, you know, when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. So um, if if I could go back to that time and know what I know now and have the confidence to share, you know, different parts of the disease with people and, you know, to the points that Melanie and Carol were making with the care team, the shared humanity and connection, having that personal connection, not just with your care team, but with your own friends outside of of the hospitals and the doctors, so they have an understanding of what your your life is really like with CF. It just it totally would change things. So um, I, I would definitely go at it with a much more confident and, and different approach. Probably, uh, you know, in, in going into college, especially. That's great advice. Thanks, Ryan. Jennifer, what advice would you give to, to yourself or somebody struggling? Um, I guess I we had when our daughters were younger. There were a lot of health problems and we, we felt like we weren't being listened to. We had to change doctors. And I think we didn't, sh we could have changed, we, we, we didn't really realize that we could do that. And I think, mm. um, you know, even though at that bronchoscopy, we sort of acted in the moment, it was harder to do that changing providers within the same clinic. But we, uh, I think I would have, I'd like, I would say speak up earlier and communicate that information because there was a much, we were able to get a much better fit within the same clinic and that made a world of difference. But it did take us a little while to get there. So that would be my advice. If you're feeling, if you have questions, um, act on them sooner or do something about it. Melanie, any advice you want to give to your to your younger self? You're not invincible. Mm. Maybe you're still here, still fighting. Oh no, but I mean, <laughs> I think in my teenage years and college especially, you're, I was, um, I had the, the luxury of being healthier and not needing to stick to my treatment regimen like I do now. And yeah. I've seen it time and time again. It, it does catch up with you. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so to tell my younger self that it will catch up with you, I think that I would have done it a little bit differently. Thanks for your candor, Melanie. You're welcome. Carol, anything you want to add? Any advice you'd give to somebody going through a rough patch? Well, Carol, I think we have you on um, mute. Oh, oh you're there good. You are. You're back. Okay. Uh, as a care team member, I have had several young adults and actually several parents bear with me how anxious they are when they come to clinic. And I wish I had known that so much sooner so that I could help 
And what they shared with me was them coming to clinic was like a test. They were waiting for their poor numbers on their pulmonary function tests or waiting for that bacteria to be identified or, um, I don't know, some bad news that their care provider was going to give them. And they just worked so hard and then they came to clinic and got bad news and it was it was really hard for them to hear. And I, I really have tried my best to convey that to our healthcare team so that we can um, work to help people um, who are coming to clinic anxious and afraid and um, really sort of take a look at mental health issues as well as physical health issues and realize that the care team can be part of the problem sometimes. And, and I really want to look at that. I, I think it shouldn't be so hard to get help to take care of yourself. Thanks, Carol, for sharing that. I think um, we talked about a little, this a little bit in the prep yesterday, and I think one of the things that Carol, um, Carol's story reminds us is that a, a lot of us feel anxious. I think that's particularly true right now, thinking about being reunited, as Melanie's saying for us, that does feel good, but also concerning and worrying about things like infection control. So I think for for everybody who's who's out there thinking about upcoming clinic visits or um, going going to get treatment and feels that apprehension, we're, we're with you. And I think Carol's encouraging us to share that concern with our team so that they can understand what's going on. Yeah, some yeah. of you wear anxiety very well. We wouldn't know. <laughs> well, Stacy, the one thing I'd like to add to that is yeah. it's, the approach that Carol is talking about is one of the major changes that I've personally seen with a lot of the care teams and clinics is they do have a much stronger focus on mental health of patients, which probably didn't exist 10 to 15 years ago. Not that it wasn't a concern, but it wasn't a, a regular thought process. And I think it's it's a very real scenario for a lot of people to go through frustration, depression, sadness, anxiety, all of those things as you go into a point, especially when you're not feeling well. And it can feel very, um, very burying every single time. It's just one more thing and one more thing. And I really appreciate the fact that the foundation in particular has made such a large effort and investment in improving the mental health of patients and their care team having a focus on that, that, you know, it's made things much easier as, at least for myself personally, um, but I think that's shared across a lot of people who have CF. Thanks. Um, we have a, one more question that came through. I would love to hear from folks about collaborative communication during virtual visits. And uh, I can weigh in a little about, about this too, but I'd love for any of our panelists who have had a virtual visit to speak up about what they think might be the some keys or tips about effective and collaborative communication virtually. Anybody want to take it on? Well, I, I did see the question in that they're right. Like some centers are sending out home spirometry, but that's like, that train is just starting to leave the station. Um, and I get that that's a part of anxiety is not knowing what our breathing tests are, what our PFTs are, what our cultures are doing. but I think it helps a lot to have simple things like vital signs. If you can, a lot of um, my vital sign equipment I got on Amazon, super cheap. And coming prepared with what you can, I think helps a lot. And also I write down all of my questions ahead of time so that I don't get sidetracked or distracted. Right, I think that's one of my tips is that when we're, uh, our clinic's 90 minutes away, so we usually had all that car time to make sure we were all on the same page about what we needed to get out of this visit. But now when the commute is like not even 90 seconds, I noticed that like the first five minutes of the appointment were lost for me. And so I think using that skill of like, can we just take a pause? Can I reset? Or having done my homework earlier. With Anybody else on virtual tips? I participated in a local town hall recently where uh, I know the clinic was talking about sending spirometers to 
uh, a small number of people who, you know, who were having more regular tests. And I thought that was pretty interesting. But I, I echo what Melanie was saying, which is it's a very different type of appointment going in prepared. And, and Stacey, similar to yourself, you know, you don't have that that drive time to really collect your thoughts and think about it. So, you know, knowing what the objectives are going in, uh, having a good idea on what, you know, maybe your weight is or how you're feeling and different things that you can ask during the, the appointment. I think those are, you know, it's it's pretty consistent, at least my experience. Carol, I'm sorry, I cut you off. It's okay. I, I was going to say from care team perspective, it is really helpful if you could give us a height and a weight so that we could calculate that ever promising BMI. Um, and then we do look at your activity level, right? I mean, I know we're all sort of supposed to be isolating in place, but with a mask, it's really important both for your mental health and your lung health that we get out and walk or ride a bike or climb some stairs or swim in your backyard pool or, you know, get some sort of exercise to, to keep those lungs working and elastic. Um, but I, I actually really like the, the telehealth visits. They um, give me a new perspective, and I think it really gives the care team a new perspective on our families. And their, um, I think you're just very different when you come to the clinic and when you're in your very own home. And it's, mm. a, it's, a, nice, um, it's a nice difference to be able to observe. Thanks, Carol, for helping us understand the upside of that. I would just um, say one more thing I feel like I've learned from um, adults with CF who have shared so generously with parents in the community is um, you, you all know your bodies and you're so confident in that expertise. And I think that during the virtual visits, that's one time when I'm thinking about how to help my teenagers really lean into that. Because if we don't have spirometry or no one can examine them, how can I support my teenagers to really think about how they feel and to know that they're the expert and know that it's part of their role to explain how they feel? So I think that's the other thing is helping teens think about, you know, we, we, we know things about our body even when we don't have the data to tell you. And so how do we really share that um, expertise? Uh, so I think we have one more poll question here that uh, Danielle is going to link for us that I think will provide us just a bit more time to reflect on. So if you can go to the poll, uh, the question here is how do you like to discuss important topics with your care team? Your choices are tell me everything, give me the cliff notes summary, I just want to know one thing, and can you email me that and I'll get back to you. Maybe you're a person who needs time to think. So which one of those describes you? And maybe our panelists will be able to reflect on, on um, who they are and what they found to be helpful. I will say that um, it's, I think about this question a lot, actually, because I've, I've had um, a few different pulmonologists with different styles. I have one pulmonologist that does tell me everything. Um, and I had another pulmonologist who really held her cards closer to her chest. And at first that drove me crazy, but I, in retrospect, I really see the value in it because I think like the internet, if you Google something and you see that this is what the worst case scenario that could happen, it does something to you psychologically and I don't know, I, I appreciated that she held back some of the more, not facts, but possibilities, because mm. it allowed us to sit with what was instead of the what is. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it also reminds me of what we heard Jennifer say in the opening was having a conversation about how we're going to have conversations. So if you know you're a person that's tell me everything, that would be so useful to tell your team. And even the different styles, I like, Melanie, how you came to appreciate the second style, and now maybe that's information that you might pass on if you have a different provider in the future. But I think this idea of knowing the style of communication we like and just telling it out loud seems like it could be a really effective way 
And in that same vein, I want to recommend a resource that's being provided by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and it's called It's All About Me. And some of the prompts you saw us use today in the popcorn questions are similar to the things that you could tell your team. So, uh, for example, in my own clinic, well, we're working with a new provider, and there's an all about me that we could share information about our family, but there's an all about me for the provider. So I think this is a great way to get into that shared humanity. Some of it is about us personally, but the rest of it is about these preferences that we have, that I'm a person that wants to know everything, or I'm a person that would really appreciate if I can text you if we have an emergency, or um, I want to know how is the best way to get a hold of my care team. So the All About Me guides will be in the resources after the session, and we recommend that you download them fill them out about yourself and offer them to your team as well. And is there anything, I think we have just enough time, maybe one minute uh, for each panelist to make a closing comment, maybe something that you wish I would have asked you and I didn't, or something that pertains um, particularly. And I know that there were some questions we talked about in at the start um, that and especially about uh, engaging other people from your family in your care and communication, if any of you are interested in mentioning that, or just giving us any words of advice. So, Brian, how about we start with you for the closing round? Sure. So, uh, you know, I'm fortunate that um, my wife, prior to meeting her, knew about cystic fibrosis. So uh, she had a close friend who she grew up with who had it, we met at a CF Foundation event. Um, so for me, you know, I had the ability to meet someone who at least understood it. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, we've worked on as, as part of our relationship is she has better understandings of the disease and how I handle it. You know, when your parents, and, and Jennifer, you can probably relate to this experience, you have such a deep understanding as a parent on what's normal and not normal whether that's a, a type of breathing or a cough or anything like that, you just you recognize those moments. And those are things that, that my wife has, has really built up as, you know, we've gotten to know each other. So we've been very fortunate. But uh, I would say communication definitely goes beyond the care team at the clinic. It, it goes to your circle of, of people and family and friends that are right around you. Um, so they can put that pulse on when you're healthy and when you're not. Um, and if you're not, they can help either give you the nudge to go get taken care of or, you know, sometimes they can be that, that group that lifts you up and makes you feel better about things and encourages you to, to approach things differently. So that's kind of my, my conclusion. And, and before I, I totally pass it off to someone else, I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity. This has been fantastic. And Stacey, you've been a terrific moderator. So uh, I really appreciate all the efforts and, and all the collaboration that we've taken part in. So uh, Carol, I'll, I'll hand it off to you in this next one. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I was going to say the same. I really enjoyed working with you guys, and it's really a privilege to be able to be speaking on this platform. I, I think I would, the thing I would say is to keep trying if the care team's not working for you or an individual is not working for you, to keep trying at that relationship. I, I agree with Ryan. You know, we can't, we can't all get along, even within our families. Um, Everyone's got their quirks, uh, but sometimes you only need them for one thing. You know, you mm -hmm. don't need to love them. You just need to be able to work with them. So keep trying. Thank you, Carol. Jennifer, I know some people would love a word or two of wisdom about coaching and supporting your children into being collaborative communicators. And we've got just about a minute left. I guess I would say that you know, in those appointments, when you're there as a parent, the way you act towards the team is what your children witness. And so you're modeling that behavior. So if you want, that's really important to remember. And um, I think it's important to teach, to involve your children at a young age to get them to talk about their own health so that they, you know, hopefully the clinicians are asking them even at a young age and not looking to you as the parent because you do want your children to be able to speak for themselves and then to be able to self-advocate later on. And I think it's really important to, um, you know, be to like what was said as far as developing the relationship with the providers, but just to remember always that your children are learning from you. So that's what I would, I don't know if that. Yeah, that's great. That's Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Melanie, take us out. 
Self-advocate, self-advocate, self-advocate. We are not our team's only patient, and they are not gods, they are not robots, they are human beings, and they miss, they may be missing something. And so it's our job, mm -hmm. if we have a thought or a need, we have to self-advocate for it, because it's not that they don't agree, they just might be missing it. They're human. Awesome. Thank you to my panelists, mic drop to Mel, who I think gave us the perfect <laughs> closing. And so to everybody out there, please be well, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Great job, Stacey. Uh, great job. <laughs>